Good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I would like to thank Julio for inviting me and giving, you, giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, as he said, I have been here maybe 24, 25 years ago, I don't remember, and for this question in my memory. Uh, and I have very vivid memories of that time. It was really uh, different. The rooms were cubicles. There were only three Italians. And it was <laughs> that's because Parisi only had three students at that time. Uh, and, uh, and it was also an opportunity for me to shift the topic of my PhD. And I started collaborating with one of the instructors of the time, uh, Zoltan Ratz who happened to have been teaching here. And it was a very, very, very good experience. I hope uh, that it will be, in some ways, as influential for you as it was for me, and probably for the others that were attending back then. Uh, Andrea Cavagna was the same year as I was. And, uh, well, it's, yes, uh, that's about all I have to say about the, you know, the, the history, because now I have to tell you what I'm here for. And, uh, so Julio asked me to lecture on the methods and techniques used for uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. Uh, this is a rather vast area, so already I have chopped off a part of non-equilibrium systems that you might have heard of, but if any kind of system in which there is a macroscopic flow of something, you know, a current of charges or heat, energy, uh, matter, I have eliminated. And for a long time, this was really the core of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. But such systems, I will not even talk about them. Perhaps, perhaps tomorrow, just very briefly, but that, that's going to be all. So I'll be most interested in telling you about the techniques and methods that can be used to tackle non-equilibrium systems in which you know, the non-equilibrium nature is not always obvious. Uh, so before I I'll just go into the details of the first lecture. Maybe it's good that I tell you more or less the outline so that you know where we're heading. And I will begin really, really smoothly. And I will tell you about master equations. And I will have an hour and a half to tell you about master equations, focal point equations, long fat dynamics, stochastic calculus, and path integrals. But I'm guessing that most of you have heard you, even if are, you're not special, most of you have heard about these things. So then, and it only comes in lecture number two, and I'm, I will try to discuss what it is to be or not to be in equilibrium. Uh, and, yeah, to be. Or not to be. And it's not such an easy question to answer because it very much depends on, on the knowledge you have on the system. Uh, then, because I have to keep in mind you know, that I'm here to teach you about methods, I will show you some of the... Yes, you have a question. Bigger, yes. Well, uh, while I'm writing the outline, you tell me if this is, if this is okay. Okay? So I want to tell you about rare events a little bit, and some applications, okay, and some applications of, you know, path integrals to these things. And you will see that uh, even though these are methods that can be used uh, in equilibrium in competition with other methods, when you're out of equilibrium, uh, there are very often the only available tools that you can actually use. Uh, then comes a specific brand of non-equilibrium systems which is active matter, and you will have lots, I, I think Andrea will speak about active, active systems, but the kind of active, active systems that I will be describing is of the simplest form. I mean, this, will, this is often called scalar active matter, so these are round-shaped particles, you know, repulsive interactions, and already this will be not so trivial. Then it will be time, and this is, you know, a tentative uh, schedule, okay? And maybe, maybe I will not succeed to do everything, but then I would like to tell you about population dynamics, and before I can go into the details and teach you real methods, I'd like to take uh, an example, a chemical reaction as an example. 
because it will allow me also to present to you a new bit, a new piece of formalism that's very useful for uh, the description of some non-equilibrium systems. And also, as you know, we will have been bathing in Langevin equations till now, you will see that these Langevin equations have limitations and that you have to go beyond them or find alternatives to uh, Langevin equations, even if you're trying to, you know, to attempt some mesoscopic description of whatever system you're interested in. Then there is a, a number six, which is actually six one and six two, because I guess this will be two lectures, in which I will talk about uh, <coughs> epidemic processes. Phase transitions occurring in the uh, stationary state of you know, reactive particles. And uh, I will, you know, that would be mostly the application of the techniques seen up there. But I will also try and tell you that when you do non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, sometimes fluctuations are not so important, and you have also to have in your toolbox tools that come from nonlinear dynamics. And that's the way things are. But uh, and a final lecture. I don't really know. Uh, I have a week to get prepared for it, but I have <laughs> two options, and it will be depending on you. So either I want to tell you about prey predator systems, or, or maybe both, I want to tell you about systems in which interactions are mediated by some surrounding field that is of no physical interest, but it, that is actually contributing to the interesting physics at work. Okay, so uh, I guess you've got the outline now, and let's go a little bit into the details here. Uh, this is really, uh, I, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm giving you some time to wake up from the saving and from the, the ice cream. So first thing I want to tell you, so maybe this is too small now, uh, I want to tell you about the physics behind the master equation. And what we do, what we implicitly do when we write the master equation, then there are continuum versions of the master equation which are called Fox-like equation. And I'm not very good at names, so maybe this is not the pure Fox-like equation that I will be describing, but it's close enough. Uh, then I want to discuss a few. Um, I want to discuss stochastic calculus. So how do you do differential calculus with things that cannot be differentiated? Which is really a pleasure for a physicist, you know. You feel like you're insulting mathematicians at each line, but, but actually this can be controlled. Uh, and then I will give you a few examples taken from real life and from my own, you know, activities also. Uh, examples, there's an S, and if everything goes right, so I'll tell you about path intervals, okay? So that's a rather heavy meal for the 6.30, uh, the 6, uh, 6 p.m., 7.30 uh, time slot, but uh, let's get started, okay? So, I'm sorry, my writing will improve. It's only that I've not been teaching for two or three months, so you lose the ability to write big. The physics behind the master equation. So my point of view on this, on this master equation thing, is that, well, we all know that at, at some microscopic level, I mean, when you try to describe a system, that is characterized by uh, degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom that are really microscopic and that include everything, the environment, the system of interest, things that you don't care about. There is always the possibility to write a linear equation first order in time for the probability to find the system in a microstate C at time t, and that's a linear equation, so let me write it you know, with a linear operator that I call W applied on P of C and T. Uh, so, for instance, the Liouville equation is one such instance of an equation. But of course, usually you're not interested in that at all. You're interested only in the subset of the degrees of freedom. 
So if you think of the colloid in water, you're only interested in the position of the colloid, not in the positions of the water molecules. So what you usually do is that you have some subset of the degrees of freedom. Let's call that. Uh, um, they are a function of the original microscopic uh, degrees of freedom. And you're asking, what is the probability that, oh, I should write it the other one around, that you get a macroscopic observable C curly, calligraphic C, sorry. And let me call that P of C and T. And that's the thing that I'm interested in, OK, this probability. Of course, uh, if I can write an equation for this little p here, maybe I can write an equation for the capital P here for the degrees of freedom of interest. And there are techniques to, for doing that. These are called the projection techniques. And I will not go very deeply into that. I will just tell you how it works. Uh, because these are not techniques that are uh, often used, except maybe for those of, uh, that are working on mode coupling theory. Uh, so the, th the trick here, if you want to access this guy here, is to introduce some auxiliary quantity, which is written like this, and which is defined by this probability, C of C, divided by the number of ways that you can get the configuration capital C of C. And let me define this. This is the number of C's such that C of C equals this curly C. That's lots of C's. Yeah. I hope you can you know, find your way through the C's. Yes, I'm writing small again because I'm reaching the bottom, so I'm trying to yeah. lose you. Yes. <laughs> OK, I'll, I'll do better. But feel free to you know, send friendly reminders from time to time. Don't, don't send me an ice cream, OK? OK, so once. interested in modeling the kinetic energy of some system. Mm -hmm. okay? If you know its velocity, then your observable of interest would be v squared mm -hmm. times the mass divided by 2. Okay. Okay? So that's a function of the original degrees of freedom. Okay. It may be just that you're selecting a subset of the interesting degrees of freedom, which is usually the case. So that's big function capital C is selecting the degrees of freedom that you're interested in. Okay. Yeah? And then you define this as your new configurations of interest. But that's, I'm just doing you know, the mesoscopic step almost explicitly here. OK? So uh, using these notations, if you define q as 1 minus p times p, yes, then what you can prove, and it's, it's really just algebra, is that, oh, let's write big. Uh, you can write coupled equations for both Q and this P bar here. And what I want to do is eliminate Q because I'm not interested in Q. Okay? So there will be a part which is inherited from the original dynamics. And there will be a part that will be coming from the coupling to the other uninteresting degrees of freedom, Q, that's contained in Q. And DTQ equals the same, too small again, or reasonable? OK. And, uh, and what else? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, yes, plus, uh, plus, uh, no, but I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Uh, let's. Uh, I think 
that's p bar plus q. That's what I should write. So you see what I will, what I should be doing if I were doing the mathematics completely. I want to integrate this equation, and I will get q as a functional of p bar. And then once I have this, I can put it back in here, and I've got an equation for p bar or for my capital P, which is the same. Okay, if you do that, given this is a linear equation, the generic form that you will get for your equation for p, the capital P, which is almost the same as the p bar, will have in general you know, the following form. It will have a memory term that is coming from you know, solving this equation, which involves computing the exponential of this operator, linear operator acting on q, which is horrible. No one does that, usually, OK? And I'm not even writing that. It's just an exponential. It's an operator, OK, which depends on two times. And that will have indices that are depending on some configurations. And here I have, and I should be summing over the C prime. So that's the generic form of what you obtain. And at this stage, well, this is not very nice, but then people do approximations. And in particular, if this thing here, which is called a memory kernel, has one characteristic time scale, which is you know, the most important, and if it happens that this time scale is short with respect to any time scale for the relevant dynamics of your C observable, capital curly C observables, then, well, you can forget about the memory and replace that by some sort of a delta at the scale, and you end up on an equation which is called the master equation. Of course, so I'm, and I am using now the final notations, okay? So this is a master equation, and that's an approximation on some original exact equation that is based on assuming the existence of a separation of time scales be between the phenomena of interest which are on the dynamics of these configurations, and the rest of the environment whose dynamics you assume is fast enough at the scale that is of interest to you, okay? When you do that, it's called a Markov approximation. You're doing some, something which is not completely uh, innocent, mathematically speaking, and we will see that popping up in several places afterwards. So a process C whose evolution is described by this, it's called a Markov process. And of course, you could tell me, yeah, you have to do all that because you already had it here. Yes, it's true that a particular case of a Markov process is a deterministic process. But here, this thing does not necessarily encode a deterministic process. You will have randomness. And let's go and see what's inside this big matrix W. OK, yes? What makes you say that the little c is deterministic? If, if no, I, I said that even if it is deterministic, and I said, this is the Liouville equation, for instance. So if C is the set of QIs, PIs, then the traditional notation would be this. And you would have Liouville equation. I'm not saying that whenever you do statistical mechanics, you should go back to Liouville. I'm just, you know, this is the spirit of the thing. That even if you start from something deterministic, after a while, if you remove some degrees of freedom, you end up having something not necessarily deterministic. OK. OK. So that would be my starting point. And uh, what I will do afterwards is based on the master equation. And I will assume that there is always a level of description in which such a master equation holds, okay? And, and that's, yes, that's what I'll be doing. Okay, uh, so examples, of course, include the coils and water, which I have been describing. Uh, uh, you can think also of, because this will come back afterwards, of a Nicolas bacterium, 
And certainly you don't want to describe the details of the rotary motor based on pH, on, you know, on chemistry, on pH pumps and all that. You don't want to describe that. And you are, at least for people doing active matter, you're just well, well enough that you can describe the E. coli bacterium by some sort of a particle with a run and tumble motion, forgetting about all the details of the chemistry that is propelling the particle. Okay? So maybe just a few details. Uh, the matrix element CC prime, they have the generic structure. Uh, and this is called the rate of hopping from C prime to C. The orthogonal term is here to ensure the conservation of probability. And I call this R of C because I think that's the standard notation. It's called the escape rate. And I will tell you in a minute what this is. So W of C to C prime dt is the probability that between T and T plus dt, you hop from C to C prime. You could also have the rates depending on time, but that will come afterwards, okay? Uh, so there are interesting properties of this operator, W. It conserves probability, it conserves positivity. Uh, if you are dealing with a finite number of these states here, you can prove all sorts of nice theorems. Un uniqueness of the stationary state. Stationary state is defined as the solution of this equation equal to zero. Lots of things that probably all, most of you have heard. So. And if anyone has not heard about that, then he comes to me for the 1.30, 5.30 period tomorrow. OK, so I'd like to say a little more about what's happening in the continuum limit. Because very often, the degrees of freedom of interest are not discrete. They're continuous. And there are special techniques for that, which are based on stochastic calculus. And what I'd like to do is just, OK, rewrite this master equation for continuous degrees of freedom, which I will generically call x. So I will trade c for x, because x has more the flavor of a continuum variable. But you can see this x as a big, large dimensional variable. It's living in some large dimensional space, r to the n, I don't know, something like that. And the master equation reads, uh, what does it read? Uh, so I'm just adopting, uh, adapting notations. So now rates are actually density of rates. Uh, minus yes, again, small probably. And this or this R here is the rate at which you escape configuration C or the rate at which you escape location X. Okay? So uh, what I will do to you know, get closer to the Langevin equations and all that, I will just shift notations uh, a little bit. And I will write this rate of hopping from X to X prime as a function of both X and the size of the jump. OK? Which I can always do. And if I do that, then this master equation takes a slightly different form. Master equation, you can see now, this is just a random walk in some configuration space with, with rates for hopping from one vertex namely configuration to another. Uh, but I need to work on this thing here if I want to make contact with one of my equations. So, uh, so using a slight change of variables here, because this guy here, oh, I can use colors. Is, oh, 
omega of x prime x minus x prime. And this one is here omega of x, x prime minus x. Uh, I will use uh, a slightly different notation here. And I will set x prime equals x minus r. Uh, r. Uh, yes, r. Bear with me. Uh, so that's x minus x prime in this integral here. And I will use the opposite r in this integral here. Okay, so that's the master equation reads slightly different, but it's just a change of variables. Uh, dr omega x minus r. Uh, uh, sorry. R. Yeah, P of x minus r, t minus omega of x r, p of x t. Which you can always write, you know, as a series expansion, it's calling for it, you know, almost. It's shouting at you, expand me in the first variable, so let's do that. Uh, so that's a summation over. Uh, minus, yes, sorry, k, or factorial k. Uh, I have the n, the kth derivative with respect to the first variable here. Then I have this thing here. And still this also inside the derivative. So it's just a complicated way of writing an integral equation by using an infinite series of differentials. Uh, but it's actually useful because these coefficients here will turn out to have some physical meaning. And uh, I think such an expansion is, is called the kramer smoyle expansion. OK? So, so far, I haven't lost anything. Uh, this is a function of x, OK? And it's good to see what kind of physical meaning these ak's may have, OK? So, in order to endow the ak's with some physical meaning, well, physical in the sense that we see what that is, but I am not into examples yet. Uh, let's consider a process that is starting from time t0. All right, t0 with position x0. And then I'm starting from here, and I'm going to run the random number generator between t0 and t0 plus delta t. Then I will end up with some variable x. And I'm interested in the random variable, which is the difference between the initial state and the final state between t0 and t0 plus delta t. OK, so this is not a very complicated variable to look at. Actually, I can look at the various moments of this thing. Should we come in? theoretician and experimentalist. It took me four, four boards to erase before I, I thought that the theory was wrong. Yeah. OK, uh, let's look at the moments of the random variable delta x. So delta x to some power, OK. This is going to be given by, uh, let me call it u, u to the k, and that's the probability of being at x0 plus u at time t0 plus delta t, given that I was at x0 at time t0. And of course, there is the initial condition uh, x 
t0, sorry, x0, t0, which is delta of x minus x0, so that's a delta of u. Okay? So here, what I'm going to do is that I'm, you know, I'm interested in what's happening in the delta t goes to 0 limit for small delta t. Oh, well, sorry. And for delta t going to 0, well, I just have to expand uh, in powers of delta t here. So this is going to be p plus delta t dtp plus higher orders that I'm not really interested in. I'm going to look at the lowest non-trivial order. If I replace p here by its value when delta t equals to 0, this is a delta of u. And unless k equals 0, this is giving me a 0 integral. Okay, This is just delta of u. OK, so uh, let's simplify things a little bit. And what you see almost immediately is that, uh, is that what? What do you see? Delta t. Uh, d u u k. And then I have this dp, which looks like an infinite series minus to the n over a factorial n. And there is the nth derivative with respect to u, which I can call like that, of a n of x0 plus u, p of x0 plus u, t0, which is the delta of u, this thing here, x0, t0. Okay. So I'm going to do an integration by parts. And probably you can see that almost by visual inspection, that by integrating by parts and by substituting this with the delta of u, what I'm doing is that I'm selecting the ak here. And the minus 1 over uh, minus 1 to the n is exactly here to compensate the number of integration by parts that are necessary. So what you see is that for delta t goes to 0, this is just ak of x0. So the physical meaning of these AKs is very straightforward. They are just you know, the infinitesimal moments of the displacement of your random process. Okay. Okay. So of course you could say, yeah, but you've been using you know scalar notations. Yes, I'm sure that if x is a vector, you see how to generalize this. But if I, you know, if I would be taking my time, I would be, you know, trying to convince you that for various components of the delta x, you can actually connect the various coefficients appearing in this vectorial Planck equation in the same fashion, and that you would have a corresponding a corresponding tensor with many indices to put in here, okay? Which I'm not doing, but I'm sure you're expecting that. What is maybe not so well controlled is when I will go from x, which is my variable of interest here, uh, maybe with some components, to some field, phi, living in space. And then all of a sudden, the components which index the dimension of your degree of freedom, they become space. And the degree of freedom of interest becomes the field. OK? Uh, OK, so you could say, yes, but I want to do physics. Tell me how, what to do with this thing. Well, <laughs> there are various approximations that you can do to, to continue here. And one of them has been discussed just before, after the question by uh, Matteo, which is, OK, what, uh, what if I truncate this series? What if I have a good reason to remove all the terms in the series but the first one? Then you've got a deterministic process. OK? If A1 is kept, but the others, 
others thrown away. This is deterministic dynamics. Now, you could say, no, I, I want to do more. I want to keep the first and the second. If A1, A2 are kept, uh, I think this is the real Fokker Planck equation. This is a diffusive dynamics, a diffusive approximation. And for this to be true, you really need a good reason to throw out the A3, A4. So there has to be some physical reason for which you can actually you know, uh, use this diffusive approximation. And if you think of the colloid in water, really the moments of the displacement are very, very small with respect to the size of the colloid. So there is a separation of length scales that allows you to do that. But it's not always the case that in physical systems of interest, you have such a separation of, of scales. The thing is that I'm not going to go much further down. If you do, if you do anything else, then it's unphysical, unless you keep the whole series. That's the way things are. Mathematics are that if you truncate to A7 here, you will end up having a probability that does not conserve, uh, that cannot remain positive. So you're stuck. Either A1, A1, A2, or keep the whole thing. That's the way things are. Which doesn't prevent people from doing that anyhow, being aware of what they are doing. And if there was a recent, I think, 2017 PNAS of people from stochastic finance that were actually truncating to order three, and I can give you the references afterwards, but uh, we're not going to do with finance here. Uh, okay, so I think I told you what I wanted to tell you about uh, the master equation. Of course, this has been, you know, super fast. Uh, if you have questions before I move on to stochastic calculus, it's a good time now. So maybe just burn it up. Yes? You said keeping A1 and A2 always better than only keeping A1. A1, you mean? The deterministic dynamics. It depends. It depends on the physical system. You know, so this has to be discussed on a case to case basis. I don't know. It depends. And I will discuss examples in which, you know, if, for instance, you have a bacterium. So I'm anticipating, but I'm just trying to answer. Whose motion, which I suppose you know is overdamped, is written like this. And you tell me, oh, I can use diffusive dynamics, then this is called Brownian motion, not uh, RTP anymore. And it's not just a change of name. There's also different physics. So you would have to tell me what good reason you have to for keeping some of the terms and forgetting about others. And this has to be. Stuff. You have a question? Yeah. If instead of doing Kramer's Noyal expansion, we use, for example, the, the finite test expansion, all these problems with the coefficients disappear or they are rearranged in some other way? No, so uh, you're talking about fun company's expansion? Yes. Yeah. So that's slightly different. Here you're talking about systems in which there is some sort of central limit theorem applying, okay? Which we know is governed by a Gaussian. But the expansion is not done. In the, in the, yes, and, and then the remaining terms pick up powers which are inverse of the system size, and then you can forget about them. So, uh, yes, you can do that, and some people do that. For instance, I think what uh, Ada, Julio are, are doing when they do population dynamics, they use Gaussian noises. And of course, because I'm here to tease them, I will show examples of population dynamics in which if you do that, it fails. And it depends, you know? And you have to be aware of what you're doing. That's all I'm saying. Uh, okay, so. Okay. So. So when you have your system described by this, you know, it's a very statistical mechanical approach. You think of a probability describing the state of the system. But there are alternative approaches to describe the same physics. And these are based on evolution equations for the degrees of freedom. Of course, since you're describing a random process, there has to be some sort of randomness in the 
the equation of motion describing your, your system. Uh, I, so I will seldom give references, uh, mostly because maybe I make mistakes by not citing people, but also because it would be too lengthy. So I'll be happy to update. Uh, I think there is a Dropbox for that. So and, and Ada has promised to clear up all the references also, so that's good. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to direct you to uh, a recent review paper by Giovanni Falzoni. He's from Messina University. And he's a professor I have to read in, in science of construction. And you shouldn't be laughing because these people know much more than, than what we physicists know. And it's called uh, stochastic, uh, so let me, communication in nonlinear science and numerical simulation. And I think with that you should be able to find it. So it's how to do stochastic differential calculus for Gaussian and non-Gaussian noises. And unless I have some good reason to drop the rest of the series here and not to try, you know, I can either truncate at order two, having diffusive dynamics, which you know, you know, is somehow represented by Brown in motion, there is no reason. If I have no good reason to do that, then there is no reason for my stochastic equation to somehow have a Gaussian noise. And you have to learn how to do stochastic calculus with a noise which is not Gaussian. However, since we're describing a Markov process in all these cases that I'll be interested in, the noise is white, okay? It has no time correlations. Okay, so there are alternative approaches to this question of how you know you can write uh, differential equations for the degrees of freedom that have some noise. Another approach uh, he knew how to pick his PhD students uh, is by Feynman and Vernon, in which you uh, write some equation of motion, you know. Uh, for the degree of freedom of interest, and there are some forces. Maybe there is some forces created by the environment on the system. And then you write equations of motion for the environment, which I denote by a capital R here. You integrate out this R here, which you express in terms of the R, put it back in here, and then you've got an equation with memory again for the degrees of freedom of interest. And the randomness comes from the sampling, say, of the initial state of your uh, environment, or the stationary state, okay? So I will not pursue this here, because it would be too time consuming, and I'm guessing that also you've seen these things, so somehow this lecture is about establishing notations and making sure that we're on the same page. So what I'll do is I will start directly from some sort of a Langevin equation. And given a process evolving according to a Langevin equation, I will try to find its uh, density, its probability, an equation for its probability, an evolution equation for its probability. And then I will remark that this equation is exactly of the same form as the Fokker-Planck equation. And two processes that have the same probability are just similar processes, or identical processes, I should say. Okay? So, stochastic calculus. There we are, we are, we have like 20 minutes to learn everything about Ito, Strato, Marcus, Engi, and all these people. So I'll be considering equations of that sort, okay? Where here, it's a noise, a random variable, a random process. Uh, even if I would stick to what you know, that is, you know, or what maybe you know the rest of it as well, but what most physicists know that is ground in motion, you know that this thing here is delta correlated. Sorry, I'm writing bigger because sometimes I realize in the middle of the formula that I'm writing too small, but. Then, if you're interested, say, in the moments between two times t and t plus delta t of this 
eta of s. Let me call that delta, delta eta. Then you will see that this is on average 0. But if this is true, its variance is ordered delta t, which means that this typically is square root delta t uh, when integrated, which means that if I look at the differential, there is a singularity in 1 over square root delta t. And that is not converging too well when delta t goes to 0. So when you're considering a process defined by this, this is mathematically ill-defined. And, and there are reasonable mathematicians, so they never write this, because it is meaningless. What they write instead is the following. They say, OK, let's sit between t and t plus delta t. And what I mean by this equation up there is the following. I mean that if I'm taking a small time interval of length duration delta t, then I update the variable x according to this rule here. And delta eta with this a random variable, you know, with some moments. Uh, Yes. So sometimes uh, the kind of processes hidden behind eta are, and I will just give you a simplified version, but it's, it's good enough, I think. You can view eta. This is a random, random noise. So it's a sequence of delta peaks, which you distribute over the time axis with a given density, say nu, a given frequency nu. Uh, and so whenever there is a peak at some random time ti, which is drawn uniformly on the time axis, then you draw a random variable li from some distribution, which I will call p pi of l. Okay, so I think this is called a Poisson point process. Uh, a sum of delta peaks with random amplitudes. Okay, so that's what I'm considering. And of course, uh, it's not so hard to determine, uh, say, the cumulants of this, of this noise or the moments of of this uh, increment of the noise. Oh, OK, so here the TIs are random. And let's say that I'm considering what's happening over some time interval 0 T ops. Uh, I throw them with a Poisson distribution that has I throw them with a Poisson distribution. There is a number n of these ti's drawn from a Poisson distribution. And and I give some distribution to describe what the the allies, how they are distributed. Uh, very often, when you do probability, it's useful to introduce generating functions or generating functionals because this is a function. So. If you're interested in the generating functional of this eta here, by definition, this is going to be and the average here, this, these brackets, they denote an average with respect to either of the three random components that enter the definition of eta. And if you do your math right, this is how it looks. And maybe it's useful to begin by you know, working on a finite interval, but this is really not necessary. 
Uh, and this is how it looks. This is a pretty compact result. Here I have an average of, uh, there's only one random variable, which is L, which I have to average over pi of L. So if you know the distribution pi of L, that's good. And uh, this is a generating function of the moments of eta. And by differentiating log of z with respect to h, then you get the successive cumulants of the noise. And they will read something like that. And that's cumulant. OK. So, so maybe at this stage, some of you will recognize that Oh, it would be cool if I only had you know, one non-trivial cumulant, and I could forget about all the others. And that would be called a Gaussian noise. So if you would be able to keep only, say, the average and maybe the variance of eta, then if all these other moments here, n larger than 3, can be either neglected, forgotten, whatever reason, or approximated away, then it's called a Gaussian noise. So let me, and what follows, uh, because I think it's too specialized, I will focus exclusively on Gaussian noise. When one can uh, approximate, approximate, when you can just throw away all the higher moments n larger than 3, then the noise is Gaussian. OK? And you can do stochastic calculus with the non-Gaussian noise. But most of what I will say afterwards has to be modified, supplemented by more refined mathematics. And it's harder can be very interesting, but it's harder. So in what follows, I will be sitting in this limit where the noise is, is a Gaussian. OK. And uh, okay. when the noise is Gaussian, and uh, Using a, a normalization in which this variance is actually unity, okay, not some prefactor. Then from the equation. from the Langevin equation, you can hope to have access to the moments of delta x. Then from 1 can compute delta x, average, delta x squared, delta x cubed, etc. Of course, I could do that also with the non-Gaussian noise, but again, let's let's narrow down the scope of what we want to say. Uh, well, I think it's pretty easy to see what's going to happen. If I compute delta x here, uh, this g depends on x of t, which is not a random variable, because I'm starting from t, and then I'm looking at a random process between t and t plus delta t. So delta x, on average, if I divide by delta t, is going to be given by just f of x of t. Uh, let's look at the second moment. 
again divided by delta t in the n. We take this squared, there will be f squared delta t squared, that's small. Uh, there will be a double product, but the average of delta eta is taken to be zero. I take a zero average noise, which I should have said beforehand. And then there will be the square of this, with delta eta squared being of average one. This is just g of x, g squared. And of course, here you could say, oh yes, there are some corrections to some power, maybe here too. But if I'm looking at what's happening in the limit delta t goes to zero, this is what I have for these things here. Of course, you can go beyond. And then, not surprisingly, you will see that this is negligible with respect to delta t. So here is it. Here I have a random process where I can compute the moments of the infinitesimal jumps. They are all finite. Uh, all others beyond three and higher can be dropped out. And therefore, it will have to be described by an equation which is a fokker like equation, such that the coefficient a1 and a2 match these results. Okay. Good. In order to match uh, the description of a process described by DTP equals minus DX A one X P plus one half dx squared a2 p we choose we must identify a1 equals f a2 equals g squared and you can check for yourself that if you keep the whole series without truncating to get to the Gaussian level that it will be the same that you can identify all the higher moments in terms also of the cumulants of the noise Okay, good. Uh, so maybe before, oh no, I'm not even super light. Uh, so before we completely forget about these non Gaussian noises, or I, I, I want to give you one example of a physical realization of a system in which you, you would like to use a Langevin equation with you know Gaussian noise, but in which this is not correct. And uh, as an illustration of when the diffusive approximation is not valid, but it's a bit of a thought experiment, but I'm. Uh, you need, uh, I, I'm not very good at drawings. So something that is rotating here, but that has two parts. So one of the parts here will be bathing in some viscous fluid. And the upper part here is some, in, is some is in some heated granular gas. Then if you try to model the motion of this degree, rotational degree of freedom, you will find that the, the rotation velocity has a friction term coming from here, but it will plus some Gaussian noise. But there will also be some extra force, which is non-Gaussian. Uh, how could I call that? A psi prime. That is coming from the collisions of the granular gas. So granular gas is usually dilute. So there is a lot of time between collisions. Uh, 
that brings back fond memories, I'm guessing. <laughs> yes. Inelastic collision. The granular gas is not a system that has a Gaussian distribution for its velocity, for, sorry, for the velocity of its particles. So this doesn't help. And this is equivalent to a non-Gaussian noise here. So there, are, there is a bunch of people, and, and maybe I should refer you to them. So there is a bright Japanese uh, fellow, Kiyoshi Kanazawa, that has been working with uh, Hisao Hayakawa and Takahiro Sagawa. And they have several papers on that, starting from the 2012 PRL on how to do stochastic thermodynamics with non-Gaussian noises, which may be useful in some instances. And that's about all I will say about that, but I'm happy to say more in private. Can you write the reference briefly? Sorry? Can you write the reference briefly? Well, that's the name of the to see if I know it by heart, right? <laughs> yes. PRL. I will have to look up, sorry. The thing is that I don't know, I, I wrote, oh, the, there. Volume 108. But if you use Kanazawa and Hayakawa as keywords on Google Score, it will come out. It's, it's a nice paper, really. Is it good enough? I'd like to tell you about uh, stochastic calculus is that sometimes uh, uh, when one writes, you know, x dot, we know, as I told you, we know that we actually mean x of t plus delta t minus x of t equals f of x of t delta t plus g, g of x of t delta eta. But it turns out that some other people mean other things. And that's the way things are. Uh, but if you, if you know where your random process comes from, you know what you're writing. And sometimes, uh, uh, people use other ways of uh, Understanding this. This one is called the Ito way. But there are other ways of describing a random process. And if instead of this, we understood we understood equation one as x of t plus delta t minus x of t f of x t plus delta t of course this is repetitive here but suppose that here I change a little bit you know and I put this here then you could think oh come on it's the same you know take delta t goes to zero this guy goes away and that's the same it's true that it's the same continuous writing as this equation. But as you will see, this is not the same physics. And you have a different process. So uh, then we would end up, end up describing a different physical process. And I will show that in a minute. This way of writing one is called the Stratonovich discretization. This is 
how mathematicians write a Lanzmann equation, like this, with the Ito discretization. Unfortunately, in physics, if you do a reasoning from scratch, as I said in the beginning, you always end up having processes with some memory. You know? And eventually, you want to send the, the memory, the time of the memory, to zero. But if you take this uh, memory time to zero cleanly enough, then you will see that whatever equation of motion you start from has to be understood with this kind of discretization rather than the Ito one. So physically, what you end up with is always a Stratonovich equation, unless you postulate something else. But if you do it from scratch, you know, do the removal of the memory term cleanly, that's how it goes. And uh, OK, so you can see, yeah, but it, it, it's, it looks like a pain because if you're interested, say, in simulating, sampling the process, then you see that at each time step, you have some sort of an implicit equation for delta x, which is very not convenient. Whereas in Ito, it's almost, you know, standard iteration. So obviously, it may be more convenient if you do a numerical simulation to use Ito, but if physics tells you that this is it, then you have to find a way of, you know, converting a Stratonovich equation into an Ito one and vice versa. Also, there are interesting features with the Stratonovich discretization that I will briefly mention. So, let me push the reasoning a little bit further. So I said, oh, it's a different physics, a different physical process. How do I know? Well, since I know that most likely the whole physics is encoding in the, encoded in the A1 and A2 coefficients, these are the only things I need to compute. And if they are different from what, the ones I got before, then it means it's a different process. Okay? Uh, if strato were used, then delta x on average. Well, the beginning looks the same. But I have to pay attention to what's happening here because I have g of x plus delta x over 2, delta eta, and this is g of x plus delta x over 2 g prime plus delta x squared over uh, 8, g double prime, sorry, uh, etc. And as I said, uh, you have to be careful because delta x is all order del square root delta t. Because delta eta is order square root delta t. This guy also is square root delta t. So if you want to do some sort of an expansion in which you're capturing the correct delta t terms, you have to you know, keep track of everything. So obviously, uh, this is delta x times delta eta here. That would be a term of order delta t that will contribute, that, will, that you have to evaluate. However, this is already delta t, and this is negligible. Okay? And since I have g of x here times something whose average is 0, then I can forget about this thing. So I will just write it like this. And I have to do delta x, delta eta, to leading order. Okay. To leading order. Well, to leading order, I just have to substitute back delta x from this equation into here. And what I will find is that this is g times delta t. So already delta x over delta t for delta t going to 0, which is my a1, is f plus 1 half of g prime g. So this is enough for me to state that the processes are different because they have different, they are described by different focal blank equations. Fortunately, the other term is the same. Okay? Good. So a quick summary of this. Uh, if x dot equals f plus g eta 
is understood as Ito A1 equals F, A2 equals G squared, as Strato A1 equals F plus one half of G, G prime, sorry, and A2 is the same. Which means that if you write a Nito equation, you can convert it using that recipe book in a strato form. And, okay. For instance, x dot equals f plus g eta with a little i like ito on top is the same as f minus one half g prime g plus g eta with a little s like strato on top. Okay, so uh, should I say something else here? Yes, there are some interesting, the strato discretization is however, however, compatible with differential calculus, which means the following. If, if you're considering a variable u of t, which is some function of x and t, what you'd like to do is to be able to write du over dt equals u prime times dx over dt. So we know that if x is a stochastic process, dx over dt is not defined. So we know we're doing crap here. Yes, nevertheless, if for some reason you start from a Stratonovich discretized equation, then, and if you do this differential calculus, you know, as blindly as if the functions were differentiable, then this equation is actually correct on condition that you keep the little s on top of the equal sign. So it's very convenient because you can forget that you're dealing with non-differentiable signals and nevertheless do the usual tricks of differential calculus. Okay. I thought, uh, so I have two more things I want to say, so it's going to be short, so maybe let's not squeeze too much in here. I thought that I could discuss a few examples, you know, just for breathing purposes. Uh, and these are examples that I will be using afterwards. So uh, let me begin by the, the first one, maybe the only one that I will deal about. So instead of putting a colloid in water, put it in a bath of bacteria. Oh, uh, that's too PRL. The thing is that if I'm starting to write references, it means that uh, for the rest I shouldn't write, and there are so many missing references here that this is shameful. So, uh, if you look at the papers, what, what they do is that they have a, a two-dimensional soap film. There are bacteria, E. coli, I think it's E. coli, yes, a bacterial colony which is trapped within the, the film. And you also trap, they also trapped a passive bead inside the film. So you really have this colloidal particle here, and these are the E. coli. Okay around. And the goal here is just, you know, you're like Perrin or Langevin or just a century later, and you want to ask about the dynamics of this guy here. So because they did measurements of the mean square displacement of the particle, they were able to realize that the, Brownian, the, the motion was not Brownian, that there was some memory term, short time ballistics. Large time diffusive.
So if you look at the dynamics of this passive beat, so these are E coli. Uh, maybe you don't know, but you have many of them inside you. Uh, so there are microns, a few five microns, I think, length. Uh, and uh, let's see. So you can think, OK. Uh, short time ballistic, large time diffusive, let's see. So maybe I should, it would be more credible if I do a hand written plots of the MSD. And this is uh, fast, slow, t squared, t. Uh, velocity, typical velocity is a few tens of microns per second. Uh, and I think they measured also the I think I remember reading that the velocity distribution is is almost Maxwell like Gaussian, but but it's always hard to observe deviations from a Gaussian. So if you look at uh, these bacteria, they just do straight lines, then they stop, they rotate, etc. And you can assume that this guy here is going to inherit some of the features of the of the motion of the bacteria. So people have been modeling either the motion of the bacteria or that of the bead by a random process in which you have the position of the particle in some sort of overdamped limit. You neglect inertial effects. And the right-hand side with a fixed velocity v0, because that's what's happening, and a unit vector. Which is random. So if I take it Gaussian or not Gaussian, it doesn't really change anything because I won't have the t squared behavior here. So here you see that uh, you have to drop the assumption that you know you're dealing with a Markov process, and you have to think that maybe U itself has some internal dynamics, and which involves some memory, and this is what people do. So U. Uh, flips with frequency nu, uh, and the tip of nu is just you know doing pointing randomly at the surface of a unit sphere, and every one over nu, and it's flipping direction. Okay. Then what you can show is that. The correlations of this vector, they decay exponentially with some fixed typical, oops, sorry. Typical uh, thumb, um, tumbling time. Uh, what's the connection? Well, U itself can be viewed as a non-Gaussian process. It's obviously non-Gaussian because it's normally conserved. So it cannot be described, the dynamics of U cannot be described by a long equation. Uh, it's a Poisson process because it's going to flip. And uh, it's driven, sorry, by Poisson noise. And you see that it has some memory. So here, the Markov process is given by, you know, the, maybe I should do this. Uh, first, I should tell you how to get this. Uh, in order to uh, see this, one should write uh, the focus like equation for for R and U. And that will read something like, so there is streaming, 
and then there is some solid angle to ensure normalization minus no sorry minus this. So if you want to describe the dynamics of the particle using that kind of modeling, you see that you have a combination of ingredients that are uh, non-Gaussian noise, memory. So usually interesting physics, you know, lies uh, well, it may lie somewhat away from what I've just so said, you know, describe noise equations with Gaussian noise, no memory. Uh, however, if you take the limit in which nu goes to infinity, uh, and v0 goes to 0 in an appropriate way, then you will recover a Gaussian process. But these limits are not appropriate for describing this experiment here. That's the way things uh, the way things are. And therefore, if you would take these limits, not appropriate, you would recover, you would turn this U into a random noise whose magnitude would be well approximated by a Gaussian, of course, and you would lose uh, you would lose the interesting features that we'll see in lecture four that are coming from this unusual dynamics of the bacteria. Uh, should, do I have time for another example? Or I, okay. Yes. Um, if, you, if you consider the browning particle on a very short time scale, you'd see the same ballistic to diffusive crossover, right? So what is it that's special about the bacteria that makes it different than browning motion on a different scale? Yes. So maybe I will translate. Or I will propose a translation, and you will tell me if, if you agree. What he's saying is that, OK, if I have this, uh, then I will also have some memory, and I will also have ballistic short time behavior. And uh, so what is it special? Well, at this stage, nothing. If you look at one particle, I couldn't tell you if there is anything special. Actually, I would tell you this is an equilibrium process. This is lecture two. To me, this is an equilibrium process. So nothing special, same. But yeah. Okay, it's not the answer I was expecting. No, <laughs> but of course, yes. Okay. So, <laughs> but it is true. And then I will give you a definition of being in equilibrium that makes the statement true. So maybe you don't agree with my definition. No, no, no. I want to hear the definition tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> but that, but uh, yeah. Okay. However, yes, there will be some refinements, but that's basically the answer. It's a very good question. But I, there was some spoiling involved. <laughs> OK. Uh, so I have some opportunity to go back to bacteria. So let me just. And I, I don't want to rush because this is important. Uh, I was expecting I'd be faster, but one more tool in the toolbox. Toolbox. So we've seen master equation and Fokker-Planck equation. They are the same, right? Just the continuum version one of the other. There is this Gaussian approximation or diffusive approximation. We've seen stochastic equations at the speed of light. Uh, and you've, I have tried to make, make you feel the difficulties of manipulating signals that are you know, not smooth functions as we, as we usually like. Uh, there is no more physics in a Langevin equation than there is in a Fokker-Planck equation. It just maybe that sometimes it's easier to handle the Lasby equation than it is the Fokker-Planck equation or you know, the other way around. And the third pillar of the toolbox would be path integrals. And this is what I'd like to tell you now. I'd like to tell you, once you have a process defined, say, by a Langevin equation or a Fokker-Planck equation, how do you express things in terms of path integrals? And again, there will be no extra physics in there. It's just one more tool that may prove more convenient. 
And of course, the reason I'm insisting on that tool is that in some cases, there are, even though everything is equivalent to everything, I just don't know how to proceed without that tool. Okay? So let me just set the stage, and, uh, and I, I don't want to rush that. So bear with me. You will have the rest tomorrow. So our starting point. is x dot equals f plus g times eta, you know, with this. And immediately you should tell me this is meaningless. You should never write this. Of course, you don't want to make it longer because you're hungry, maybe. But let me put a little i on top so that I know that I'm safe. I know what I mean when I'm writing this, OK? Of course, I could have chosen to start from something else, but I'm, I'm not choosing that, OK? So, uh, I, you know, there is, this is something you should know. By is discretized. So we will discretize the time axis, okay? Because that's easier. And I will look at things over a time window, this, and I will cut it into m or m plus one slices, I never know. Uh, and I will call xk. Uh, x at k times delta t, where delta t is my observation time divided by capital M. So I, you know, I'm approximating my process by a sequence of points that's easier to, to handle. So let me write the discrete version, and I will leave the rest as a homework for tomorrow. So the Lanzmann equation in Ito style here is written as this, f of xk times delta t. So that's the delta x, okay? Plus here, g. And the important thing, as you realize, is that I know where I want to evaluate this g. And that's before the process just comes into play. Uh, times times what twi times square root delta t, and maybe I should call that psi k. And psi k is a random Gaussian variable with unit correlations. Okay. Of course, implicitly, I want to take the delta t goes to zero limit, which I will postpone to the very end. Uh, and what am I interested in? If a of x of t is a physical observable, our goal is to write the average of a of x of t as an integral over all paths of a of x and t Oops. Uh, with some weight, which depends on the path. So my goal is to establish such a thing, to tell you what this means, what this looks like, and to tell you that even that goal is not always the most convenient. There are two formulations of path integrations that I will describe. One is uh, the so-called onsager mach loop formula, and the other one is the Janssen deterministic one. And I will describe them both tomorrow. And I think I'm up with my time, and it's useless that I begin. So thanks for listening.